Hare Krishna Gauranga Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Prabhupada. Pranams to you. Thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us. You know the GBC strategic planning team uh, began in earnest uh, to help the devotees with regard to the COVID. And then uh, we kept moving forward with other interesting things in relationship to devotee care like that. Today, we have uh, the sober celebration of Jasomati Nandan Prabhu, who has uh, just in the last two hours uh, left this mortal world as a result of his contact with uh, COVID. So uh, I did not do a lot of service with him, direct service. I have been in multiple meetings with him over time, and of course, always found him to be a Vaishnava and a gentleman. And, but I do know that his life was extraordinarily successful in the service of Srila Prabhupada. You, on the other hand, have known him well. Um, maybe uh, before we begin on what we originally planned to do on this meeting, it would be very nice if you could tell us something about him, his life, his energy, and all of the success that he had in his life. I offer my prostrated dandavats to Yashomati Nandan Prabhu. Wonderful Vaishnava who joined Srila Prabhupada in Detroit. And uh, Srila Prabhupada specifically instructed him to establish preaching in Ahmedabad. Hmm. As uh, all of us are aware that, you know, Gujarat has been one of the most important places from where now our current Prime Minister Modi ji is has also been the chief minister for many years. So Yashomati Nandan Prabhu was very instrumental to establish ISKCON's presence very strongly over several successful temples in Gujarat. The first one is in Ahmedabad. There is another one in Baroda. Then there is another one in Vallabh Vidyanagar. Then there is another one in Surat, one in uh, you know Rajkot, Dwarka. So many such temples are there and he was the zonal secretary working very closely with His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. And uh, because of his determined efforts, ISKCON has established very strong presence in Gujarat. And uh, it was thanks to his leadership, his pioneering vision. And he was also very, very astute in study of Srila Prabhupada's books. And I have heard several of his classes and uh, he was extremely well read in Srila Prabhupada's books, especially the Chaitanya Charitamrita. He had a very powerful hold over the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And in the last uh, five to six years, all of us could see uh, an extra burst of energy in him. It was something very unique. His health was going down, but his enthusiasm and energy was uh, growing. And it was as if he really wanted to give in the last uh, bit of his every ounce of energy to push Srila Prabhupada's movement. So in the last five years, uh, if you have seen the Ahmedabad temple before, the last five years, it was completely redone with mm -hmm. a new guest house, you know, uh, 25 to 30 rooms guest house, a beautiful, one of the best restaurants I've ever seen and uh, an amazing uh, preaching in output which began over the last four to five years. Mm -hmm. So overall, I, I could say that he was really... Uh, very much focused on getting the next generation of leaders together, empowering them, inspiring them, and uh, be right there. And although he went through lots of ups and downs in his health over the last four or five years, he got a stroke which severely limited his capacity to move, but there was uh, nothing to shake his enthusiasm and his determination. Mm. So he had a leader all through till the very end, and uh, we really miss his association. He was a source of great inspiration for all of us, especially amongst the younger generation in ISKCON. And uh, ISKCON Ahmedabad in particular is very much uh, bereft of a very uh, stalwart leader and uh, they must be feeling extremely orphaned by his absence. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. And uh, all glories to Jasa Mati Nandan Prabhu. Uh, maybe uh, we do our uh, interview about you, but 
before we even dig into that, let's just take this one step forward. All of Srila Prabhupada's direct disciples are older. Uh, some of the, uh, even the youngest ones are 65 and 67. What are we going to do? How will this movement continue from a succession point of view? What are the concerns that we have as a result of leaders such as Josa Matinanda and Prabhu leaving? All of us are going to be leaving one of these days soon. What to do? Well, Samanashila Prabhupada wants uh, what will happen to the movement after you leave. And uh, Prabhupada said, I'll never leave. I'll always be present in my books. So basically, memory of kindness received is gratitude. The Bhagavatam defines gratitude as krita gya to remember what we have received mm. so therefore you know every generation of devotees they remember what they have received from their previous generation and then they try to reciprocate by trying to serve and so we have to be grateful in prosperity and tolerant in adversity and uh, the beauty of the parampara is that as soon as the blessings come, then the empowerment also follows. So Raghunath Das Goswami, after uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's departure in 1534, Mahaprabhu, in incidentally, as we are, you know, just a side point as we're discussing about uh, lockdown, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually took sannyas on 14th of January 1510 and spent two years traveling South India. Then he came back to Jagannath Puri 1512 and for the next two years he was trying his level best to request all the uh, residents of Puri to allow him to go to Vrindavan. Because as soon as Mahaprabhu took sannyas, he actually wanted to go to Vrindavan. Nityanand Prabhu sent him to Bengal. There mm. Sachimata told him, you should stay in Puri, not in Vrindavan. And that was the beginning of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, actual experience of sannyas, where he had to renounce his original plan, which was mm. to stay in Vrindavan. Mm. So then in 1514, finally Mahaprabhu managed to travel towards Vrindavan via Bengal. There in Bengal, Sanatan Goswami met him and told him, it's not good to travel in such big crowds. You should go back. So he came back again to Puri. And in 1515, Dashira, which is like tomorrow is Dashira. In 1515, Lord Chaitanya actually started his journey to Vrindavan. Mm. And he reached Vrindavan on the last day of Karthik and spent two months there. And then when he came back to Puri in 1516 for the next 18 years, he was there in Jagannath Puri. And if you have been to Puri, you have seen his, you know, Gambhira quarters, which is a very, very small place you know, hardly 50 square feet. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was staying there in one sense, locked down. I mean, he would go around here and there, but the last 12 years he was literally locked down, but revealing that his mission was to unlock the love of God within. And so when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, ended his pastimes in 1534, Raghunath Das Goswami felt totally desperate and uh, he came to Vrindavan to end his life from by jumping from the Govardhan. So then Rupa and Sanatan Goswami told Raghunath Das Goswami that why don't you just speak about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes and that will mitigate your feelings of separation. And so through service, the feelings of separation are mitigated by remembering the instructions uh, of our superiors. We are actually able to associate with them and I think Srila Prabhupada has uh, created a beautiful blueprint by which this mission can continue if we follow in the footsteps of our predecessor Acharyas, taking their instructions upon our head and trying to follow to the best of our capacity. Mm. And then specifically, he has given us Srinam. He has given us the translations of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. Right. He has given us association, and an element of that association is ISKCON. 
Iskan is one of his greatest gifts. So it would seem that part of the answer is also we, we must serve Iskan and continue to make Iskan better. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Just like, uh, you know, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave the mission and the mission was Name Ruchi, taste in the holy name, Vaishnava Seva, serving the Vaishnavas and being empowered by the blessings of the Vaishnavas, Jeeva Daya, spread compassion. Srila Prabhupada gave us the institution and uh, thanks to the institution of ISKCON, we are actually able to spread Krishna consciousness and create impact in ways it would not have been possible as an individual. And I think it's extremely important for us to uh, recognize this fact that thanks to the institution, we are actually, we have been able to spread Krishna consciousness globally. And uh, in the last 55 years, we have distributed more than 500 million pieces of literature, uh, Srila Prabhupada's books, which would not have been possible if we did not have an institution. And last year, a couple of years ago in Chicago, during the World Hindu Congress, ISKCON was uh, one of the organizations which was recognized and given an award for uh, being an organization which has excelled in spreading the message of the Gita in multiple languages in every possible nook and corner of the world, mm. in spite of whatever may have been the local culture. And uh, the global Hindu community uh, recognized us and uh, uh, expressed gratitude for making Gita so popular. That would not have been possible without an institution. Mm. And in one sense, we all uh, owe a debt to the institution because we became devotees. And it was through Srila Prabhupada's mercy of spreading Krishna consciousness through this institution that we came in touch with it. Uh, right. Tell, tell us something. How did you... How did you come in touch with uh, ISKCON? What were you doing at the time? And uh, tell us about how you joined. Yeah, I was uh, studying uh, engineering at IIT Mumbai, 89 to 93. And when I was in my last year, uh, one of my uh, you know, friends, he started visiting ISKCON and he got connected. And uh, I was curious to find out what he's doing. And uh, I started also attending. And I, I uh, graduated and I was uh, doing a job. I worked for a few months in a corporate. And then, uh, interestingly, there was a car accident. Mm -hmm. Bhakti Rasam Maharaj was uh, driving and we and went into a you know, program and we were returning back. And uh, suddenly there was a truck which pulled up right in front of us. We were going at high speed and the car rammed against the truck and it was like a head-on collision. And, uh, you know, it appeared that I'm not going to survive because the whole body was filled with blood and everything. And then, you know, I, we were taken to a hospital and uh, the glass pieces were taken out. And But amazingly, the injury was not much. But when I went to see the car the next day, at the police station, they told me that uh, whoever must have been in this car would not have survived. So I felt that uh, I have received a second life. And that mm. gave me the conviction that uh, whoever has saved my life, I must dedicate my life to him. And so, you know, I kind of got convinced at that moment to uh, give my life totally uh, to Krishna consciousness movement. And then, you know, in India, the situation, especially amongst the youth, although India is the land of Sanatan Dharma, and uh, we have approximately 270 million students in uh, 1.5 million schools in India, and uh, approximately 30 million students in colleges, in around 60, 70 colleges, 70,000 colleges and 900 universities. But one of the biggest challenges is how to inspire them in uh, sense control and having good habits because you know all over the world more than 15 million people struggle with alcohol disorder and uh, you know alcohol kills 
4,700 teens every single year. Mm. And uh, just drunken driving in America itself costs $199 billion every year. And uh, tobacco smoking, I've seen young students get into addictions and last century tobacco addiction killed 100 million people and this century you know 2000 to 2100 it may kill 1 billion people and it kills 6 million people across the um, whole globe every year so you know one death every 5 seconds and that was a time when i was thinking we should do something to share this knowledge of the gita with the youth and so, you know, both Radhisham Prabhu and myself uh, in 1993, we decided that uh, we would dedicate our lives to share the message of the Gita, to help uh, especially the younger generation understand this knowledge much better. And that was the time Chopati Temple was also kind of uh, beginning with the leadership of Radhanath Maharaj. So I think I was at the right time at the right place. Mm. And so your first service, uh, you aligned with uh, your dear friend uh, Radhisham uh, Prabhu and you got your youth preaching uh, going. Yeah, I mean, we began with youth preaching at that uh, particular moment. And then just after that, uh, Radhisham Prabhu left for Pune because uh, he really wanted to expand the youth preaching and uh, Maharaj wanted somebody to go to Pune. And so that's how the youth preaching began in mumbai we had a team of many people who were joining and uh, in pune radhisham prabhu started and few other devotees went to smaller uh, towns across maharashtra and things got going from that point onwards and how did your service uh, continue tell us about that yeah actually i began with preaching and it was basically the most uh, prominent uh, service but along with that as you know that Radhanath Maharaj is a firm believer in uh, you know training in humble menial service so he would always be emphatic that uh, you should not be on the intellectual platform you should be on the spiritual platform and one time he told me that uh, I don't want you to spend your whole life speaking about Krishna I want you to realize Krishna mm. and therefore it's important that you imbibe the mood of uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu of Trinadapi Suni Chena and therefore right from the beginning even though I was doing college preaching I was also put in the kitchen so a part of the training was also cooking for the devotees and any other kinds of uh, menial service which was there and then you know as the temple started growing as you know uh, Leo Tolstoy in his novel, Anna Karenina, he says that happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Mm. Which means that, you know, for a, a family to be happy, it has to be uh, fully functional in all, it, all its elements, all its aspects. And if there is a deficiency even in one of the aspects, then there will be problems. So as we were growing, there was a need to uh, improve the administration. And so, you know, Radhanath Maharaj then gradually started uh, engaging some of us in uh, administration, DT department, art department, improving the uh, suites for the DTs and maintenance and cleanliness. And we were one of the first to create a full fledged database, uh, disciple database, way back in 2001, 2002. Then uh, we also started a, a legal department. Then, you know, as you know, that Maharaj had this uh, vision of having uh, Artha Forum where some of the business people, they would share their profits with the temple. And through that, we could buy a lot of property. And uh, so we started a Govindas also. So that was also a unique experience. And then there was an overhaul of the entire temple. It's a hundred year old building. So we had to do a lot of construction to make it really functional. And uh, at that point of time, uh, you know, my good uh, fortune was to be engaged in many, many uh, new startup services, one which had no relation with the other. So mm. that gave a lot of experience and confidence. And then 
from 2005 onwards i was quite focused on also improving the training with respect to uh, either shastra training training the youth who come into the temple vaishnav training then brahmachari training skills training and in 2012 we began the bhakti vedanta research center in uh, govardhan eco village and now it is affiliated to mumbai university for the first time we created a system in iskon where any new brahmachari joining will have to go through all of shila prabhupada's books of bhagavatam mm. and chaitanya charitamrita for two years then mm. they actually enter the ashram so these were you know some of the services in that particular period so uh you have like it's like at every step of your career in krishna consciousness you've taken on more and more responsibility but if i'm to understand you correctly the basis of that is your humble service mood not that you wish to be some leader or something like that you have some aspiration to lead rather you have an aspiration to serve is that correct yeah see um it all depends on which context you are put in so i have been in a situation where radhanath maharaj became the gbc for chopati around the same time when i joined and as they say that you know sometimes relationships just uh, work so you know he had certain uh, vision in mind and he needed someone to also help in executing and uh, you know i had the passion and the willingness to do that and uh, he is also not a person who would force somebody to do something uh, or push someone to do something so he saw that there is some latent eagerness to engage in some service and he kind of engaged and that's how it was like mm. you know hand in glove so one of the very successful projects that you've uh uh been in charge of and worked on is the is the Govardhan Eco Village and right. uh give us a little bit of a history of that i mean it, it's such an extraordinary project it's having worldwide effect tell us something about that tell us about the vision of it and yeah. and uh and how you worked with that so actually um shila prabhupad when he established his con temples in north america he also had a great desire to have several farm communities and some of them were like gita nagri and new talavan and new vrindavan and so uh, radhanath maharaj had spent time with uh, shila prabhupad during his visits in new vrindavan and he had heard about shila prabhupad's desire uh, for five things in new vrindavan number one agriculture second cow protection third education fourth uh, having 12 forests in uh, seven temples of vrindavan and fifth was a retreat center so interestingly what happened was in 1972 prabhupada did the bhumi pujan or uh, foundation laying ceremony for uh, cornerstone laying ceremony for radha govind the temple in new vrindavan mm. and just after that you know the devotees uh, they approached prabhupada and said that you want us to make a replica of vrindavan but we have not been to vrindavan so if you come and stay here with us then you can guide us how to create vrindavan so prabhupada said yes if you uh, you know make arrangements like that so i'm willing to come and stay here personally and guide you about how to create this seven temples and there are you know letters of prabhupada to that effect and then they started therefore uh, creating the house for prabhupada to live and that house ultimately went on to become the uh, palace of gold so i mean that got completed only in 1979 mm. after shri prabhupad left so in the process what happened was that once the palace opened it was so successful and it was so attractive and it uh, created such uh, news everywhere and thousands of people started visiting in buses to new vrindavan and uh, you know gradually people uh, who were leading at that particular point in time got more focused into other kinds of projects and this original vision of prabhupada on the seven temples kind of you know got relegated to the background and uh, 
so it did not manifest there at that point of time and then when yuvrindavan came back to his con in 97 so that time radhanath maharaj uh, tried to uh, collect lakshmi and uh, have something going there again to revive this but again certain problems happened it didn't uh, manifest so at that point of time uh, maharaj had one of his disciples in pune who was doing a master's degree in uh, architecture go to vrindavan and take the dimensions of all the temples and uh, because pune university gave a request to the archaeological survey of india so then they permitted and thanks to that the modern mohan temple detailed uh, drawings could be taken mm. and you know those drawings were also sent to new vrindavan and one drawing kept kept with this architect here in pune but you know when things didn't happen so one thing i uh, saw very uh, amazing is that uh, even if the vision of a leader it does not fructify immediately um, a, a leader may sometimes be perplexed but he does not become discouraged mm. and so i saw that uh, you know maharaj continued aspiring and in our own case in chopati we began the city temple and the city temple is quite famous uh, chopati temple but most people don't realize that right from the moment we got the city temple in 88 from that time onwards we started searching for a farmland mm. in 1996 we actually got a piece of uh, 50 acres just outside pune in a place called down and uh, it was uh, cultivated and uh, developed for agriculture preparing for the y2k from 96 to 2000 and for four years we had several families staying there of devotee farmers but somehow they had some difference of opinion with respect to uh, how the agriculture must be done and so it didn't work out mm. and so in 2001 we had to exit that uh, project and close it down and then for two years again we searched for several hundred pieces of land and in 2003 uh, we again got this land which is the mm. current land so till then the vision was govardhan farm but then as the climate change crisis uh, loomed large and then you know radhanath maharaj kind of brought in the idea of also something which will be sustainable and therefore we kind of renamed it from govardhan farm to govardhan eco village mm. and uh, this was in 2009 so by this time i had been working with so many projects with maharaj so at that time then you know he was really very eager that something like this be developed in fact he said um, i i would like to have this as my 60th birthday present which was in 2010 mm. so um, therefore at that particular point in time we did not have any money even to go and do some research because there were some issues and one of the monks who was joining the ashram he gave a donation of uh, 200,000 rupees from the savings which he had which he was going to give to his family and with that a uh, couple of us went around India searching for different architects and then finally you know we uh, selected one architect and with the help of that architect actually you know, one thing I realized that we may be expert in uh, Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita and philosophy thanks to Srila Prabhupada and his books but there are many other areas in life in which we are not the subject experts and uh, you know my biggest experience was to become humble in front of many many such subject experts in different arenas and then if we just uh, be in the right mood and attitude with them and try to utilize their skills in Sri Prabhupada's mission rather than trying to become expert ourselves so it really uh, goes a long way so it was mm. important you know, during this eco village creation, and so now Govardhan Eco Village is accredited to uh, four different United Nations bodies. One is the United Nations Environment Program, uh, United Nations Convention for Combating Desertification, United Nations Economic and Social Council, and United Nations World Tourism Organization. Mm. So we have a, a very wonderful uh, connection with UN as part of a dialogue for policy for global environmental planning. Mm. Very successful project and very interesting how you uh, uh, got that established. I think it was somewhere around 2012 or 11 
that you began to do service on a uh, global level with the GBC. How, yes, that's how right. you, so t tell us tell us that story. How did that start? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there used to be uh, this Pam Ho email group. It's still there, but uh, previously it was uh, used much more than now. So on one of the Pam Ho free forum announcements, I saw, uh, you know, a letter which announced about uh, various initiatives which the uh, strategic planning team is starting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at that particular point of time, you had various, you know, divisional levels like devotee care, temple administration, this, that. And it was in 2010-11 that uh, I had... Uh, gathered a team of devotees and we had uh, conducted an ISO 22,000 for our kitchen and ISO 9001 for our temple. Uh, so I was just, uh, some, some of our uh, audience may not know what I, uh, ISO is. Uh, just a brief explanation on that. Yeah, basically it is international standards for creating systems. So for, you know, if you have uh, proper systems for quality control, with respect to processes in your temple, then you get an ISO 9001. That means you create a system which is not a person dependent, but it is system dependent. Mm. And most of the you know, globally acclaimed uh, organizations have this. For environment, it is ISO 14000. So this is basically kind of a benchmark uh, for uh, credibility with respect to a particular focus area. Mm. So, uh, I was into that at that time. And then when I saw these uh, announcements, so I thought, oh, wow, there are, there is a group of people in ISKCON who are also thinking about uh, uh, strategic planning and, uh, uh, you know, futuristic in their process. So then I reached out, uh, I think it was an email ID for Kaunteya Prabhu and I reached out to him and then I uh, came and met both of you in Juhu temple. And, uh, you know, you invited us to the next meeting and then, that's how the journey began. And I was so inspired to see, you know, some of the initiatives, especially at the org dev, which have really inspired me that uh, to navigate leadership in ISKCON is quite challenging. And uh, the way I have seen both yourself and Kauntia Prabhu conduct meetings, which is very uh, proactive, very determined, but willing to be patient. So it has been a tremendous learning experience for me and, uh, you know, and especially I would like you to share something about your vision for the ILS because that has been one of the inspirational experiences for many of us in the next generation. How did you come about that? Well, maybe we could talk more on some other, on another interview because uh, you are such a significant leader and I'm sure our audience wants to hear from you. I work, uh, as you know, in the in the background um but uh, but let's just let's just go a little bit further with this uh uh effort that you started making you joined uh, the gbc organizational development committee when when did you join uh, i i joined in 2013 13 and i've been a member ever since yes and uh uh that you know it's it, it, it's similar to the story that you told um uh, Radhanath Maharaj attempted this, didn't quite work out, but never became discouraged, uh, moved over to here, found success. It's almost uh, uh, sometimes I think of a, a saying that came from Winston Churchill, uh, no failure is ever fatal. And uh, that kind of, you know, struck a chord in my mind. Uh, and, and frankly, he, had, he said another thing, which was not all successes last forever either. So sometimes, uh, you know, there's failures along the line. I believe that the efforts that the GBC uh, have made uh, have made a difference. And, uh, and I think that uh, one of the reasons is that uh, we've stayed on it and we've right. kept with it and we never did get discouraged. So you've been a big part of that. Uh, the Organizational Development Committee has accomplished an, uh, an awful lot. Certainly we saw, and to go back to your question, I guess I will take the time to answer it. We saw a need for stronger leadership 
and management in ISKCON. Uh, this uh, goes back to a uh, an interesting day that I had in 2005 or six. Uh, I was visiting uh, Giri Raj Maharaj on a regular basis, uh, telling him what I was doing in terms of my service and whatnot. And so he told me a story. And uh, subsequently, I wrote that story up and sent it to him and asked him to approve it. Uh, since it was his words, not mine, I was more or less reporting on it. But basically, near the time of Srila Prabhupada's departure from this mortal world, uh, the, he was there serving Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada called for him in the middle of the night. And, he, you know, he was concerned because it was in a little bit of an unusual moment. Maybe he was even thinking that Srila Prabhupada was going to give him final instructions or something like that. So he hurried on down. It was in the middle of the night, like midnight, something like that. And Srila Prabhupada was in an internal space at that point. And it took him a minute or two to speak. And he asked Giri Raj Maharaj, uh, will this movement continue upon my departure? Giri Raj Maharaj gave him a, 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 a good answer, but it was actually not an answer that fully satisfied Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Giri Raj's answer was, as long as we continue to chant our rounds and follow our principles, uh, we will be successful. And Prabhupada kind of, in his internal mood, just went, mm, and he waited for like a minute to speak. And then he finally said two words, organization and intelligence. That's what's required. So uh, I became inspired by that story and other stories in my life to help with the organization. Well, we talk about the uh, ISKCON Leadership Sangha as just one example. The There is no event except for that event, frankly where devotees, leaders get together and spend time on leadership and management uh, topics. There's plenty of sanghas for kirtan and for festivals. And these are, of course, very, very important. The, the basis of our life is our devotional service. But part of our devotional service is to lead and manage. And so we created that. Uh, we've had good success with it. Uh, typically, over a thousand leaders come every other year. Of course, uh, we were to schedule one of these uh, coming up in 2000. And uh, uh, when our last one was 2020. And uh, so then our next one is 2022. And uh, we'll, we, we may be through this COVID thing so that we may end up having that after all. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a good thing. Now uh, you are also part of the nominations committee uh, globally, uh, so right. you do service on that. Uh, so basically, if we look at your career, you continue to take on more and more service. A lot of service in the zone of Maharashtra and that area, then global service. Um, in that process, I think that you've seen a lot of issues. Um, when we look at ISKCON from a futuristic point of view, what are some of the issues that actually really do need to be solved so that we can secure a better future for ISKCON? Right. Uh, I think uh, one of the first uh, principles which we need to address is that the effectiveness of a decision is equal to quality of a decision multiplied by acceptance square. Mm. With the kind of, uh, you know, modern day value systems which have uh, affected people all over the world, decision making has become more and more difficult because I don't think any other time in history, each individual had so much power uh, 
of autonomy and expression as uh, they have today. So any decision which is made, one minute. Electricity problem? Yeah, yeah, it'll come in two, two seconds. Okay. So any decision which is made, it is subject to heavy scrutiny. So I think uh, this is a very important principle that one of the biggest challenges which leadership has today is one has to be extremely mature and balanced. And uh, I all the more appreciate Prabhupada's mood of a collective uh, decision-making body like the GBC, because that's very important in today's context. Number two, that apart from the fact that people have such a power of expression, the second is the wealth of talent which ISKCON has. So ISKCON is filled now with almost 99.9% .9 congregation members. And if you go through the list of ISKCON temples in the Back to Godhead magazine, you know, those addresses and those buildings, they hold probably less than 0.5% of ISKCON's human resource. Mm. So in actually one sense, the entire focus of ISKCON has uh, become congregation based. That means they are right there. And uh, most of them in the congregations over the last uh, couple of decades who have got connected to ISKCON are very well established in their professions, in their careers, very successful, especially with respect to organization, administration, you know, they have seen it all, done it all. And when they come to the ISKCON temple, then they would expect a certain degree of uh, competence and governance. And therefore, uh, for those who are managing and leading ISKCON temples, it's important to have, uh, you know, buy in from such stakeholders also. We cannot be um, disconnected and isolated from prominent members of our community. Mm. And so moving forward, our leadership has to reflect a more inclusive decision making where we take in the opinions of our uh, top members of the community and include them in some process. You know, so that's a very important element. And uh, I think uh, the third element is that uh, current climate of leadership requires leaders who can cope and deal with a lot of uh, diversity and uncertainty. Mm. So, you know, the whole world has become like a global family. And so India has its priorities, West has its priorities, different countries, they have their cultures. So we need uh, leaders who can deal with a lot of diversity, a lot of uncertainty, who can deal with talent, who can be inclusive and mature in their decision making. And uh, I think then respectful love breeds joyful relationships. And mm. the quest, quest for perfection has to begin with some imperfection. And relationship will need a balance of affiliation, autonomy, and appreciation. So we have to tolerate the past, accept the present, and hope for the future. <laughs> OK. That's really beautiful. I, I, you know, I know you work with a number of devotees. Uh, ask them to uh, transcribe that and send it to me. I really <laughs> liked what I heard there. Okay. Right, so thank you. Would you would you please do that? Yeah, sure. Good. So, as you yourself look to the future for yourself, how old are you at this point? I hope you don't mind me asking. <laughs> I'm uh, forty nine and a half. Yeah. Right. So you have many years left that you can take on more and more service. So when we look into your future, how do you see your future evolving? Uh, I see that uh, ISKCON has a, a lot of talent and uh, a lot of dedicated devotees across the world. But somehow, you know, we need to integrate our uh, global efforts better and uh, create a platform by which you know temples across the world get access to what some of the more successful temples have done and i see my role in creating you know a platform where 
all the best practices and uh, some of the more successful activities of different temples become available and uh, you know across temples small temples medium temples large temples the kind of activities in iskon temples is kind of more or less the same but if you have to change 100 temples if you have a group of 100 temples then 20% are doing great 20% are really lagging behind and struggling and then 80 in the middle or whatever 60 in the middle are looking this way and that way so usually typically it is 10% at the top 10% at the bottom and the 80 are confused so if we can create uh, you know two things one is proper uh, benchmarks which this 80 can follow and then number two proper uh, online training mechanisms by which leaders across iskon and one of the initiatives you were also very much involved in was the gbc college so that was just a small glimpse but i can but you, see but that you are you are a trustee of the college <laughs> yeah that's right but you know the whole initiative started from your uh, idea but i'm just sharing that if i see in the world of uh, the christianity uh, the, so many training modules and resources church administrative administrators have online resources even during the covid i was keeping track you know so what the spt did was like absolutely magnificent because you were right there trying to provide the resources and i think in today's day and age Uh, is gone across the world has a lot of creative talented people if they just get some help hand holding in uh, these kind of resources training materials appropriate uh, online interventions mentoring coaching now with this uh, you know covid people have gone beyond geographical boundaries and people are willing to connect with anybody anywhere so i think that the covid has revealed the tremendous potential where globally iskon leaders across the world could actually hand hold and help each other and uh, you know stronger temples more successful temples could help other temples which are just struggling uh, temples which are already established could help those temples which are just beginning in their journey and i think you know i see a role uh, in that particular uh, space So Prabhu I really love your vision of what your service is and how you see it unfolding and I just want you to know I I'm very much interested in seeing what I can do to help you in that effort um we're getting near the end of our time and of course we started our time speaking about his holiness uh uh Jasomati Nandan uh Prabhu I guess he, his grace is maybe the more accurate term but just so much in andan prabhu is just left with this covid um very unfortunate maybe you could just say a few words to first the leaders of iskon and second to all the members of iskon about the importance of staying safe um this is a this is a nasty disease right. uh maybe give us your thoughts what what should we be doing should we not be staying safe and wearing mask and like that what do you think about all that i think it's an extremely uh, you know dangerous disease one of the most dangerous i have seen in terms of its ability to spread without giving any warning and uh, i think we have to be extremely careful especially uh you know those who are about the age of 60 but even otherwise and i think uh, each and every devotee in iskon is very very precious and uh, they have many many years of service to shila prabhupad uh, which they are supposed to do and we are hoping and praying that whatever precautions all of you have shared with in your uh, spt postings i think a lot of amazing uh, materials you have shared and also that uh, entire document which you put together on reopening of temples i thought that was a brilliant uh, you know set of information presented in such an appropriate manner 
That's Subhananda right. Prabhu and his team in South Africa created that as he, of course, he's a, you know, full-fledged member of the SPT. Yeah, it was yeah. an excellent document. Exactly. So, I mean, these are the kind of initiatives which I think across the world of ISKCON. Uh, I mean, philosophy-wise, we have, you know, amazing uh, presence of Srila Prabhupada's books. We don't really need any help as far as philosophy is concerned, but I think it's worth looking at how many other successful spiritual organizations I just connected with, you know, I went to the Brigham University in Utah and I had a whole tour there and I saw how they have uh, developed mm. over a period of many years and I connected with some of their leaders and found out how they managed to create a central fund. So I think there are a lot of areas and opportunities in ISKCON which need to be explored if we need to go to the next level and I think uh, you know, gradually, many like-minded process con will come together, converge, and through that conver conversations will begin. And I think that will be the beginning of uh, transformation. Mm. So, Prabhu, thank you so much for all your valuable time. It was really great listening to you. I'm totally inspired. Uh, let us talk again soon. Uh, but in the meantime. Let's specifically talk about how I can be of help uh, to you in your service. Uh, I would I would very much like to do that. So, uh, my obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.